This, this is TLV1. The Tel Aviv Review. Hello and welcome to the Tel Aviv Review. I'm your host, Gilad Halpern. Every week we bring you conversations with authors about the books and research and other things that we like. And if you like us, please consider becoming a Patreon supporter by going to our homepage. That's tlv1.fm slash review. Scroll down to the bottom and click the big red button that says Patreon. Click and support us. Some of you have been doing this for once in years and we cannot thank you enough. This interview is part of a series recorded on the occasion of a conference titled Democracy and its Alternatives, the Origins of Israel's Current Crisis. It was held earlier this year at Brandeis University's Schusterman Center for Israel Studies and organized in collaboration with the Center for Jewish History in New York. My guest is a fellow at the Schusterman Center's Institute for Advanced Israel Studies and one of the speakers at the conference. Professor Ori Trozin teaches at the Department of Jewish History at Tel Aviv University. She is the co-editor of the Journal of Israeli History and the academic director of the Dan David Society of Fellows. She has written copiously on early Israeli history, mainly the first decades of Israeli statehood, with a special interest in social history. Her new book, Emotions of Conflict, Israel 1949 to 1967, has just been published by Oxford University Press. Professor Ovri Trozin, hello and welcome back to the Tel Aviv Review. Hello, Gilad. It's good to be here. So how is the focus on emotions in this book different from other forms of social history of the same period that you explored in your previous books? Um, I think it is about, it's more about um It's most, most, more about soul-searching in the sense that it's, it's um, a very intimate history of personal feelings, but also of the nation's soul, if, I, you, know, if you want to put it uh, poetically. And how is that transformed into an object of inquiry as a historian? Um, well, there's a turn. We like to uh, define all kinds of new methods in history, in history And we define them as turns. So there's an emo- emotional turn or in, in history. And um, mostly since the 2000s, um, there's a vast corpus of uh, research all over the world about emotions. And I, I thought that Israel deserves no less. <laughs> and I discuss the public... Um, side of emotions like it's not about so much about personal emotions but how the regime or the um, polity or uh, elite tries to uh, mold the public into um, becoming more resilient and more, more immune to um, security threats and this oh, this um, uh, emotional repertoire or this uh, um, kind of norms grew or developed in the um, Yishuv era. In the, so the during, pre-state. Yeah, yeah. The, during the mandate era. And um, they were cult- further cultivated by different cultural agents, uh, from soldiers to commanders to teachers and uh, authors and politicians, obviously. Um, and... and uh, Also in, in the press. So this is... This, yeah. So, yeah. so this, basically the central theme of this politics of emotions is really dealing with this very deep sense of insecurity, physical as well as other. Um, so this sounds to me a very specifically Israeli way of coping with life. You said that your work on the history of emotion is derived from other similar parallel cases in the world. How does this very specific Israeli trait correspond with other histories of emotions around the world? It corresponds because, first of all, it is influenced by Soviet themes, by British emotional repertoire. So these are like models that during the Mandate era and afterwards are part of the imagination of the elite when they foster 
certain kinds of emotional norms. So it's not only Israeli. It is part of, a, I think, a larger emotional theme or repertoire or fashion uh, in the world around the Second World War and even the era between the two world wars. Mm-hmm. For instance, I, I look at the British... Um, there's, there's some uh, scholarship about British... Uh, Uh, emotional manners or emotional norms and also on the thread yeah. you know the famous yeah, uh, um what what is this in the keep, calm, uh, and keep calm and carry on yeah is that right is, is that like a good illustration of what a regime of uh, emotions is well it's not exactly the same in Israel and I'm not sure it was the same and it, it was really you know part of the emotional culture in the UK but it is the ability to overcome fear. And this is something that you can see in pamphlets that are given to soldiers, American soldiers, and then it's translated to for Israeli troops in 48. So it's part of a culture, a, a military culture, but it also it, it's also a way to think about the meaning of Of being a Zionist meaning of living in Israel and this meaning this meaningful existence is meant to shield you um, from the fear of death well what is the interplay again c- coming back to the very specific context of early Israel Israel the interplay with the long shadow of the Holocaust because it, it was after all, You know, the biggest trauma the biggest sense of physical insecurity and you know having to deal with management of emotions here was also greatly influenced by you know the memories and traumas that people many people in early Israel carried with them at the same time there was this great schism right you know Zionism was meant to open a new leaf and leave the the diaspora the diasporic existence and the Holocaust behind and uh, um, promise something else can, can you can you explain how how it worked out I think it's mostly you know dancing on the edge of the abyss basically that's it, it to put it mildly <laughs> so, so <laughs> there, there wasn't really a great difference between uh, the Israeli statehood and And you know dealing with the Holocaust in the I don't know forest of uh, uh, Poland just 10 years earlier no there is a big difference when you have arms when you have a meaning you have a meaningful life and you know that when you defend yourself and when you defend your country it means something to the history of your people and it's it maybe it sounds ridiculous to today but To some listeners but it, it was full of meaning and it had a lot of power and and so it worked essentially it worked yeah, yeah. I think on, on inculcating this generation or maybe several generations yeah N- not for everyone so if in, in the book I look at immigrants who recently immigrated and And were sent to live on the borders of very young uh, Israel after the 48 war and life was miserable because there were Palestinian uh, Palestinians crossing the borders so, so the borders themselves were often unmarked and killing and stealing and robbing and sometimes uh, even raping and And it was it was terrifying to live on the border and um, some veterans were sent to to live with the immigrants on the border to inculcate this kind of emotional norms and the ability to get used to the danger and live with it but it didn't work always so sometimes it didn't sometimes it didn't but if you look back and you 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 Um, see the reports from the 1967 Eve there is not such a big difference between the emotional 
behavior or emotional, the way people manifested their emotions on the borders between old time Israelis and the immigrants who arrived in the 50s. So they were able to get used to it or at least um, pretend to. <laughs> Is this um, management of emotions, this regime, uh, emotional regime, as you call it, something that usually works? I mean, it's, is it like a form of government, just like, I don't know, policing or education, or is it something more amorphous than that? Well, it is, I think it's, it is the, it is the um, emotional base of ideology. And every ideology has an emotional basis. So you ha you, it doesn't work for everyone. Because not everyone buys this to this ideology, and even if they do, they're also skeptic, and they sometimes are, in, are buying into it and sometimes don't don't. so it's it's not that st steady. But if you look at, for instance, at what happens at, on a waiting period in 1967, at the beginning of the, this time, like in the first 10, 12 days, people are terrified. And there's a lot of um, distress and uh, angst and uh, a feel that Israel was abandoned to its fate by the great powers and all kinds of very un un uncomfortable emotions. But even before the un um, unity government was formed and before Dayan became uh, Minister of uh, Defense, Those were things that were supposed to reassure the public, and indeed, did and they did. For, they for, did yeah. work, and they did re reassure the public. And even before that, you could see there's a change in the morale. The people get used to uh, what's going on, and they feel more comfortable in living in this period, and they find meaning in you know working for the public good, volunteering, doing all kinds of things, and. They also express this um, feeling that it's not like it was during the Holocaust. So I found these letters and, and people write to their um, addressees in, in wherever, in, you know, overseas. They, they say, this time it's not ghetto or Auschwitz. This time we have weapons and we are able to defend ourselves. Or Even before 1967. Before the war. Before the war, the, yeah. during the waiting period. Mm -hmm. they, so everybody thinks that, every, you know, the Holocaust was like this huge shadow, but it wasn't. In fact, if I, and, and my main source in, in writing about the emotions in this period was uh, a corpus of um, reports by the censor the, of, of letters citizens sent to their addressees overseas. They had like three centers in Tel Aviv, Jerusalem, and Haifa. And they wrote reports every day about the public morale. And, and you could see that the mood changes. And you have to ask why. And so I have all these uh, explanations. One, I think, is that the feeling of being together, uh, having a the shared fate, working for the public good. But also there's, there are all, all kinds of um, measures taken by the press to reassure people. And the, the press really has a, a very important role in boosting public morale. And I, I must say that um, the, the politicians uh, actually did very poorly. <laughs> This, uh, <laughs> So if you, if you look at uh, what Levi Eshkol did, he, he, probably, he didn't speak to the public, basically, and when he did, it was a failure. So, but the press did a lot of good. Right. So there were all sorts of uh, agents and, uh, exactly. and players uh, coming together to do that. Yeah, in the preface to the book that was written immediately after the 7th of October, mm -hmm. 2023, You're right that today's Israel is also dominated by, you know, this regime of emotions pertaining to insecurity and all that, but uh, that Israel of the 1950s and 
1960s, the, the object of, of the book, uh, is, uh, I quote, was more unlike than like today's Israel. Can you explain? I think people felt that there were um, parts of history in the sense that it was they were making history and they were not victims of history. And I think in the recent uh, years, uh, we've been trained to think that we are victims. And I think in, in the early 50s and 60s, Israelis were educated not to feel like victims, but to be masters of their destiny. And the sense of victimhood is growing, I think, since the 80s and 90s. And it's part of, it's a strange, it has some strange linkage to the fashion of, to, to the worldwide fashion of, you know, only the victims are righteous. <laughs> so Israel, whether... Uh, but but it, doesn't, it doesn't really make sense. I mean, it's counterintuitive in many ways because it is since the 1980s and even more so in this century, in the 21st century, that Israel is consolidated as this military superpower, as this economic superpower, and also this process that you describe of, you know, bringing together these disparate uh, 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 populations into a cohesive u- national unit has in many ways been completed. We are, Israelis are now much more cohesive than they were in the 1950s and the 1960s in the sense that, you know, Israel is a fait accompli, if you will, right? It's, a, it's a, the, the sense of impending insecurity. I mean, l- looking at it in, in, only in objective terms. I mean, if you look at the state of mind in the 1950s, people thought that the victory of 1948 was mere chance, right? That it could have gone the other way, just the same, and that if there's another war with, uh, with the Arab world, you know, Israel might lose. And I think that now very few people think, despite the sense of victimhood that you describe, and I agree with you, that is very present, very few people think that Israel is, uh, can be defeated in, 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 in a war. So how do you explain this, this switch? Okay, so in the 50s, Ben Gurion has like this um, amazing uh, speech in 1951, and he talks about the fact that he expects everyone to be vigilant, everyone to be on guard, and this victory depends on each and every citizen, and it it depends on your spirit, not on guns. First of all, it depends on your inner ability to control your emotions. So I would even say that sovereignty it means, in, in this era, it means controlling your own emotions. And I think since the 80s and definitely since the 90s, there we are, there's an enormous emotional surge un, that is cultivated by the press because it sells very well. If you look at television, commercial, you know, Uh, uh, television, <laughs> this is how you sell everything. You sell politicians. Everything is, um, is uh, commodified. And the market is run by emotions. And if you look at, um, in, in the 50s, it was the other way around. You say, in, in order to survive, you need to put a lid on your emotions, to recruit yourself, to take Uh, if you are afraid, you need to, we need to uh, be able to stream this fear and to turn it into volunteering and to finding meaning. So you take this surge of uh, emotional energy and you turn it to something um, that is helpful. It doesn't exist anymore. So the only way we are governed is by rivalries, Um, you know, between the left and the right, or you know, especially between the right and the and the, and the rest, and uh, 
So where are, you know, where, where is our role as citizens? What is expected of us? If you expect something from citizens, they, they have to live up to it. They, you educate them to live up to it. But you, we have no role. The army has a role. The reservists have a role. But citizens don't. And, and it's very bad. It's very bad for morale. So do you see it as some sort of an erosion of the concept of citizenship, the way early Israelis perceived it? It is a natural development in the sense that, you know, if I were um, a kibbutznik living on the Syrian border and I had a rifle and I, you know, and I had to uh, plow under fire and all that. So I had a role and I felt responsible and it was, it was terrifying, but it was also uh, fortifying the soul. <laughs> um, but then you have those, you know, rockets and missiles and things. It's out of our control. So we have no role here. Right. So part, part of it is the development of how weaponry and, and war developed. You, you seem to idealize this uh, um, state of mind of the early Israelis. Correct me if I'm wrong. So do you see, I mean, the concept that seems outlandish to some people, and I would say right, rightly so today, to raise children and expose them to great danger. I mean, raise children in communities right on the border with uh, very hostile populations just across the border that, as you, as you write also, you know, the infiltrators came into their communities and, and killed them and, and hurt them repeatedly. And this so-called stiff upper lip, the Israeli version of the stiff, stiff upper lip, said, okay, we're not leaving, right? Despite everything, we are, we are staying here and we'll raise our children because that gives us a sense of purpose, that gives us, you know, a belief in, in the future. Is it something that you, in, as Orinto was saying, as a mother of children, uh, would go back to in 20, uh, in looking at it now in 2024? I think even in the 60s, the kibbutznik found it very, very difficult to go on and, and a lot of parents, young parents with young children left the kibbutzim. And that is because the norms changed because Yaelda writes about it beautifully because she, she uh, shows how in the, during the mandate era and during the war of independence or the 48 war, the um, children were part of the war machine. And you can see that kind of um, talk, kind of uh, culture also in the uh, Great War in, in the UK. Uh, but it changed. And when the culture changes and, and people wish for their children to have a normal childhood, that it means a protected childhood, you cannot keep this going. So we can't go back in this sense, but we can go back from commodifying everything, from being unable to govern our um, the way we talk to our political rivals. Because if you look back at 1967, the citizens really yearned for a unity government because they felt that standing together made them feel more secure. And Levi Eshkol and Golda Meir rejected the idea. And the uh, religious uh, parties came begging and, and begging, you know, the leader of, of, uh, of uh, uh, Gachal, of, or the Likud, later the, what became the Likud, wanted to bring back Ben-Gurion, his uh, formidable <laughs> enemy, to become a prime minister. And they still didn't get it until they finally got it. So in this, in this sense, um, I think our government today doesn't get it and uh, is unable to stop uh, vilifying their political um, rivals and, and, many, and many vast parts of the population, which is devastating to public's, uh, the public's morale. Yeah. To, to what extent was this a conscious thing? Uh, uh, this management of, of emotions was a conscious decision on the part 
of the powers that be. I mean, did they understand the power of emotions and what it meant for the average citizen, etc.? For Ben Gurion, for sure, he always told people how they should feel. Sharet, uh, Moshe Sharet was the same. They understood what people needed and what they needed to hear, and they, they, and this is something that you know in leadership and uh, research is shown that, that this is the most effective kind of leadership is a leader that understands and speaks to the public's uh, emotions. This is no longer the case. I think um, our leadership is um, narcissistic, and I don't know, even know if they know there is a public. I think they're so self, self-absorbed and that the whole state and the country is just, decor- you know, it's just... Decoration. Are you, are you talking about the current government yes. or yes. you know the the um, political culture of I don't know recent years, recent yes. decades? Because there is a difference. I mean, the current government. Uh, I mean, I, I certainly agree w- w- with what you say. They they really break their own record on a daily basis in the you know, the extent that they disregard the so called public good. Um, but if you if you look back, even on Netanyahu, uh, that I, I I hear from what you're saying that he's probably the uh, the most nefarious actor in 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 this whole in this whole scheme. But even in the in his earlier iterations as as a leader, he was able, perhaps to a lesser extent than his predecessor, to to master this sort of a uh, you know uh, uh, emotional strength robustness. Uh, I th- it, it was tr- it's true about you know the way he dealt with uh, maybe maybe the way he dealt with the uh, COVID, mm-hmm. but he's he's not he doesn't have it he simply doesn't have it I think Olmert had more of it um, Sharon had more of it he simply you either have it or you don't I think it's kind of an emotional intelligence mm-hmm. that you either have it or you don't. I don't think uh, Shamir had it, for instance, but and and Levi Eshkol didn't have it. I mean, he understood what people needed when he was uh, head of the he was the treasurer of the Jewish agency. He definitely got it, but during his pri- you know when he was prime min- prime minister, I didn't see it. So during the crisis, maybe he he thought other th- other areas of the crisis were more important, and he definitely dealt well with them. Mm-hmm. But he didn't address this need of the public um, at this moment. That's really interesting. That it's really down to the uh, individual uh, emotional intelligence of of the leader that has really um, great repercussions for the emotional strength of the nation. Yes, and also. I, I think this is something at least a good advisor would be able to do. But if you're not, uh, you have to be sincere. You don't have to tell the whole truth to the public, but you have to have some kind of sincerity. And I don't know if Netanyahu has this ability anymore. I don't know if there's a person there anymore. Mm-hmm. Because there are so many, you know, it's like it's it's his his own personality is eroded by his desires and and his age maybe and and you know he's long it's it's a huge duress just to be prime minister for so long. To to what extent do you think that this um, sense of purpose and this great mobilization in the nineteen fifties and sixties was really what gave? Israel, its power more than its military edge, more than its um, diplomatic uh, assets, etc. It is very helpful because people are able to organize as a collective. And if people walk, if I have one of the testimonies I found is like a person who's writing a letter and saying, I'm walking in the street and I see the sad, sad faces of women possibly women whose children went to war. So this kind of interconnectedness is very important to mobilize uh, the public and also to be able to 
work together and defend yourself in various ways, whether it's uh, building fortifications or helping somebody to go into the go into the shelter and making sure that they are you know comfortable and everyone. So it, everybody was made to feel that they are responsible not only to themselves but to everyone else. This is completely gone from society because we're living in a neoliberal era where we're competing with each other over everything and and uh, and we're basically rivals zero sum game <laughs> so. the, 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 there is an enclave of that of, of that spirit of uh, uh, resilience solidarity etc today yeah. and I'm talking about the uh, religious Zionists and the settler movement. Um, they, they are the ones, actually, if you listen to them, the leaders are the ones who are touting this sort of commitment and mobilization and giving up on personal comfort and the commodification of, of life, etc., for the greater good. Um, and it is very different. I mean, the, the whole political worldview of religious Zionism is very different from the group that advocated sort of the same values 15, 16, 17 years ago that you cover in the book. How, how do you see that shift? Because they didn't expect people to become secular because they, they're mobilized or they share this kind, same ideology. You could be Haredi and, and uh, ultra orthodox and, and fight during and, and pick up a weapon and fight in the 1948 war. And you can be um, a religious Zionist and people wouldn't tell you, you know, give up your kippah, which is not what the religious Zionists are trying to do. They're trying to um, persuade, force, make in all kinds of ways, transform Israeli to society to live up to their values and their way of life. But it's, they don't speak everyone's language. So if you look at, for instance, at a speech made by Moshe Sharet in 1955 after the Czech-Egyptians arm deal, he's talking to everybody. So there's uh, a lot of um, uh, religious um, ideas in his speech and secular, and there's he mixes. So he's trying to you know, cater to everyone's culture. Well, it's the rhetoric of the current leaders of uh, religious Zionism is entirely sectorial. It's completely sectorial. Look at Barak Hiram's uh, speech. Uh, some uh, yeah, the gen general who gave yes. the speech uh, as he was appointed uh, the commander of the Gaza um, division. Yes, that, that was infused with uh, religious imagery. I mean, if uh, you know. I could go on the limb and say that if if he weren't Jewish, it would be a sort of a jihadist uh, uh, speech. Yeah, and and also saying Israeli culture is is wor is worthless. So it's completely the opposite of what the leaders, uh, both Ben Gurion and Moshe Sharet, tried to do when they knew this is you know we're not all made of the same cloth. We're very different, but we're being tested now, and we have to, each one in his own way, have to contribute to the effort. And we have to speak to everybody. So it's very, very different. Did it make you depressed to, to research and write this book? Looking back on the uh, 1950s and 60s and compare it to the current moment. Well, I, when I wrote this book, I didn't always compare it to the present. Can, can, can you escape it? And now it is, you know, I I was really concentrated. First of all, you write a book for many years, so every year is different. Every chapter, I write in a different. Some some things are, are not very pretty when I write about the fifties and the sixties. So there is a lot of ugly. Uh, it's not just glorious and beautiful, and there's a lot of ugliness and a lot of things that uh, it's very hard to face, but. Especially today, I must say, <laughs> I find it extremely depressing because we are about, you know, we're waiting for an Iranian uh, 
joint uh, retaliation by Iran and its proxy, proxies, mainly the Hezbollah. And there is no us, there is no togetherness, no nothing. It's just, and we are made to be very passive, just wait and shelter. And there's nothing for us to do except for, you know, shelter. It's not very, it's not very good. It's not very uplifting when, you know, the government is so radical and, and it, every day is just, uh, <laughs> so you've answered my question, <laughs> Professor Orit yes. Wazin, author of Emotions of Conflict, Israel 1949 to 1967. Thank you very much for coming on the show. Thank you. And uh, many thanks to Itai Shalom, the manager of CLV1 Studios, and to the Schusterman Center for Israel Studies for the generous support. And now we've got a request, because many or most of you listen to us on the Apple Podcasts app, and we'd like to ask you to uh, please consider writing a review for us. You too can support us by going to our website and subscribing onto our Patreon campaign. Check out our archive. It has probably close to a thousand interviews by, by now, if not more. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and most important, join us again next week for another edition of the Tel Aviv Review. And until then, from us here in Tel Aviv, goodbye. Goodbye.